I want you guys to think about the word faith and um, think about your own faith, what it really means, what the word believe means, what the word trust means, what the word salvation means. You see, we've been, you've been embedded uh, into American culture, worldly culture, and a lot, and we're actually living based on the definition of our culture rather than what is God's definition. And so you have to rethink because even if even though we have the Bible and it's given to us in English and you have to understand something it was translated to English and then all the other languages in the world use the English to translate into their languages and so if English does not is not able to express and define the uh, you know accurate context of God's heart then you have you know a mis communication kind of going down the line and so you need you need revelation added into you you need you need to pray and get the missing pieces of the puzzle otherwise you're just going to go with a uh, limited version if you will a limited version and you're going to think you have enough but the reality is as you live your life you know it's not enough right something's missing and even if you read the Bible, it's condensed, okay? It's condensed. Three and a half years of, of Jesus' ministry is condensed. All of the Bible is condensed. So when you read it, it sounds like everything is immediate. Deliverances are immediate. Healings are immediate. And in some cases, it can be. But we've learned as, you know, as we do ministry and as we... Uh, uh, engage with people, you realize it's not, everything is not immediate. And God tries to explain that to us through the agricultural system with the seed needs to be planted in broken ground, fertile, and needs time to grow and bear fruit. Amen? Uh, the elders, the Korean elders have been with us since the beginning of ministry. And sometimes when you do start ministry together, even not only them, but other people who have been with us for a long time, you kind of, you know, you kind of develop a, a more of a close relationship. And sometimes that close relationship um, actually will hinder you because at the end of the day, when it comes to business, uh, church business or God's government business, just like the military there is a hierarchy of of authority and you have to know that line in order to understand the government of god so that you can fully benefit and it's not that you know when god chooses people whether in the bible he chose prophets or priests or whatnot it's not that those certain people were better than you know the other people when god has his own sovereign choice you have to learn to respect that otherwise uh, uh you know you have to see your own pride and your own jealousy that's going to prevent you from uh going higher with god if you look at the relationships of spouses for example, with the elders, or even my wife and I, or anybody else. Whether marriages or whether you're an individual, we tend to position ourselves and you focus on what someone has done to you, right? You've hurt me, you, 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 you don't understand me, you don't love me, you don't respect me. You know, so the tendency is to look at somebody else and, and see what wrong they have done to you. Now, that might actually be, there could be truth in there. They could have done wrong to you. And so we go to God 
And we petition him, saying, God, this is not fair. Look what they've done to me. And sometimes, you know, God's people do that, and sometimes you do get a remedy out of it. But what you don't realize is that you're just as guilty. When you stop going after somebody and you go after yourself, then you're going to get an awakening. Otherwise, you're going to stay blind. And, and you, may, you may have forgotten because of time. If you've been married for 10 years or 20 years, it, it is buried now where you don't have a lot of feeling towards it, but it's there. And it, it, is, it has helped grow your personality and how you see your other spouse. And it's embedded in there now where it's part of your personality and part of your, just the way you live. And so you think, because you become part of it, you think like, there's like, oh, I've forgiven, I've let go, because it doesn't have that immediate impact, but it's intermingled, right? The way you treat your spouse, the way you talk to your spouse, and even if you get a, a hint that something might be there, you'll still go after the other person. And it's not that when you question, like Elder Sarah questioned her husband, I remember you giving more attention to a, the other female. And, you know, 20 years, 30 years, uh, I think they've been married 20 years. He, he may not exactly remember why he did that. Um, maybe he knows, but it's kind of buried, so the accurate information may not be there, but they remember the residual memories, right, of, of you hurt me. And so if, if your spouse the wife sees the husband like giving attention to a, to a woman, you know, the perception is, oh, you know, maybe, maybe for Elder Joseph, to him, it's just, I'm just trying to be nice to somebody, or, or maybe his motive at that time was bad, you know, whatever it may be. Her memory of that, and even though I'm just using them right now, all the spouses have this some kind of issue, right? And after 20 years, and she tried to forgive. But when you try to forgive, you're actually just burying it. You're trying to bury the memory. You're not actually forgiving. You're just burying it. And even if you have forgiven, maybe the hurt, the scar is still there. And so it's affecting your relationship, right? It's affecting the relationship between the spouses, and you're comparing your marriage based on other people. Oh, at least we're not divorced. At least we're not doing what they're doing. At least, at least you know, we're not separated. And you'll start comparing yourself to other people who are in worse condition than you, not realizing that your condition is not that great, that it can actually be much better that your marriage is not actually the ideal marriage of what God wants with his children. And because you compare with people below you, worse marriage that is, you think you're okay. And so you won't go after yourself. But you have to come to an awakening that what would have been like before the fall, before the fall of Adam and Eve, what is that ideal marriage? And you have to actually look forward, going forward, not looking back and be content where you're at. And the thing is, none of us really know where we're supposed to be. You, you can have an idea. And, and if you don't look ahead in faith, you're going to be content right here at your current level. And when somebody else gets better than you, you're like, you're like, you might just get jealous or envious or start disrespecting or throw jabs just because of your pride. 
you got to look at yourself when you do that stuff. Amen? All right, let me read a little bit about faith, and then we'll move to prayer. I want you to, I want you to see here how they're trying to define faith. You get people and, you know, you ask, you know, the religious people out there, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I have faith. You know the reflex answer, the reflex? I've been baptized. That's the reflex. I've been water baptized. Like that saves them. Uh, when I come from uh, 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 the Baptist church, I used to, I remember as a, Child, I, I, I say that too as part of my evangelism. Yeah, I've been baptized as a, as a, you know, and also as a Catholic, I was baptized as an infant, so I would add that in too. Like, you know, like, like that's going to help me or something. And so the reflex is, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a people of faith. I've been water baptized. And, you, and they think those two things save them. You know, they, that's the default, and they think they're safe, not realizing they don't know nothing. And if you say you're a people of faith, do you even know what that means? Because most people are just acknowledging. I, so what they're really saying is, I acknowledge God exists. So therefore, I will be saved. That's how they're really saying it in, in the, in, in, as far as God is looking at it. But if you say, I believe in God, besides the acknowledgement, what does that mean? Because the Bible says that even the demons believe, but they tremble. So the author of the Bible, of that verse is saying, the demons know that God exists. And that, that acknowledgement of I believe God exists is not enough to get you saved. So you have to look at that word believe and go beyond acknowledging that something exists. All right, now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. So you look at this and go, oh yeah, I got faith. I'm, I'm believing in something I don't see, right? That's, that's how most people go about. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. You know, this is just the beginning. You've got to go for the body of the context. This testimony of faith is what previous... You may scroll. Previous generations were commended for. Three, faith empowers us to see the universe was created and beautifully Coordinated. So, you know, when you, read, when you read the beginning, it's like, yeah, I got faith. I believe it happened. I believe that Jesus is going to save me. I believe Jesus is going to heal me. God's going to restore me. This is the beginning part, and it's, and it's a good part, okay? But it doesn't end there. All right. He spoke, and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Four, now here comes the examples Faith moved Abel to choose a more acceptable sacrifice to offer God than his brother Cain. And God declared them righteous because of his offering of faith. So in this verse 4, faith, the part of the definition of faith as I wrote on the band is that faith chooses something that is acceptable to God and pleases God. He sacrificed or offered to God what God wants, not what Abel says, I think, God, you should take this because I feel it's a good offering. Okay? Cain gave to God what, out of his value, out of his hard work of laboring the land and say, God, look what I've done for you. Look at my hard work. Look at the sweat I put in but that's not what God wanted even though you can put some effort in God's like no that's not what I want I want you to give what I want you to give to me that's faith you see in this case <clears throat> by faith Abel still speaks instructions to us today even though he is long dead five 
faith translated Enoch, if you don't know who Enoch is, Enoch is the one who didn't die. Okay, he got, he got he he was walking with God and God took him. Faith translated Enoch from his life and he was taken up to heaven. So he didn't get to, he didn't die. He never had to experience death. He just disappeared from this world because God promoted him for before he was translated into translated to the heavenly realm, his life had become a pleasure to God. So faith is one a person who gives God pleasure, pleases God. Okay? So your thinking has to be if I have faith, then my life has to I have to look for things or think of things or do things that pleases God. Okay? Six, and without faith living within us, it will be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that He is real and He rewards the faith of those who passionately seek Him. All right, so faith is also a person who passionately seeks Him. So because you're Christian, you think, oh, I don't need to seek Him anymore because I found Him. But, you know. You gotta go. It's like okay, I'm married, so I'm I can now just sit on the couch and 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 watch sports and don't have to go look for a spouse and have them serve me. You know, it's like you're not actually you're not seeking the deeper relationship with your spouse as a friend, best friend. Right as a as a partner, as as the, your other half, you're neglecting the true meaning of why God has sent you a wife or a husband. It's more like you got married out of convenience or something, or or just because that's what everybody does. So I guess I have to get married because everybody else gets married. You know, it's not you. You're lacking the deeper why God has brought man and woman together. You got to think about that. Why do I need to get married? Why would God want me to get married? Is it just so you can just like, you know, have kids and, and have somebody make food for you and the other one go make money for you? Hmm? All right, so uh, faith is you have to passionately seek and more than you met him, now you need to get to know him, right? You have to know who God is. Seven, faith opened Noah's heart to receive revelation and warnings from God about what was coming. So faith is also preparing for your future. Even things that have never been seen. So uh, in Noah's case, is waiting or preparing for something that has never happened in the time of that world. But he stepped out in reverent obedience to God and built an ark that would save him and his family. So instead of just referencing the history of man, he looked outside that box, and when God told him, like, I'm going to do something which is unbelievable, right, judge the world with flood, he's able to accept this and prepare now to build an ark to save his family. That's faith. Faith is you preparing, building your own personal ark with Christ so that your family members get saved. Okay? Not just you come in the church and just doing your obligations, hoping God saves your family. God will save your family if you move in faith. And there is an expectation of something supernatural or something that has, been, has not been done for you personally for God to save your family. And you have to have that open-mindedness of how he may save your family. He may, they may not come to this church, but he may save them in a different way, on their deathbed perhaps. But are you building the ark? 
Or are you just going around the mountain, getting offended halfway at the pastors or at God, and then when you get crushed, you decide, okay, you're going to submit and fall in line. Things get a little better, get offended again. Well, times are passing and people are dying, right? By his faith, the world was condemned, but Noah received God's gift of righteousness that comes by believing. He built the ark, saved him and his family. Building the ark, coming to church, praying, reading, obeying, understanding God's government, respecting authority, reconciling your issues with your spouse, with children, all the above. That's building your ark. Eight. Faith motivated Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise without even knowing ahead of time or even knowing ahead of time where he was going. Abraham stepped out in faith. So this one is kind of familiar, right? Faith also is what? Going wherever God tells you to go. Doing whatever God tells you to do. But pastor, what, what if this happened? What if that happened? Well, then that ain't faith, right? Well, I got to do what? I got to do this? Okay, well, 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 I don't see any results. See, you're, you're looking for some type of evidence. But the Bible says at the beginning, you know, there's no evidence at the beginning. You're moving without evidence. And so you're going to stop and you may demand more before you actually go. Well, that ain't faith. You might be scared of me as in you don't want a meeting with me because you think I'm going to tell you to do something you don't want to do. You're the one who's running, right? You're running then. And so faith is you're willing to do whatever God tells you to do. If it's a, you know, Elder Mata's here a couple years ago, God told them, you're going, you're going to start at the bottom. Go work, find a job at the bottom. And he was willing. But, you know, he was always contending to get a higher position because all of you want that, right? You want to get into a higher position and look like, yeah, I got this high position. I make a lot of money. But you, the pattern is that you start at the bottom, right? Joseph starts at the bottom as a slave. And you ain't getting to the top without going to the bottom first. And if you don't want to, if you want to find shortcuts, well, you just keep on going around the mountain like a hamster. You think you're going somewhere. All right. He lived by faith as an immigrant in his promised land as though it belonged to someone else. He journeyed through the land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were persuaded that they were also co-heirs of the same promise. So, for a while, faith pushed you, you have to be mobile, like, a, like an army that's ready to be deployed. You, you may not have your permanent job, you may not have your permanent career, you might not have a permanent place of residence, you're mobile, like some of our people living in other people's homes in, their, in, in renting a room. God hasn't established you yet or found you, hasn't settled you in permanency. And so when you start off, you got to know this, that God is testing your faith and sending you to the bottom so that you can learn and you can be humbled. You see? Because you, you're naturally impulsive and you want to start at the top. You think you should be paid more when you're not even worth that value. You have to prove your value to the companies or wherever you work that you, you're going to be a hard worker so that they will keep you. Right? All right, 10. His eyes of faith were set on a city with unshakable foundation whose architect and builder is God himself. You got to wait for God to set that plan or that future for you. And you're waiting 
in the middle where you're not settled. And so for some of our people, for example, you're living, renting a room, right? And God is already preparing something permanently, but you gotta, you, you're waiting, but the waiting is just not twiddling your thumb and, and playing with your phone and doing this. Your waiting has context of faith. What are you supposed to do while you wait? You're supposed to grow. You're supposed to uh, look at, you know, examine your sin and, and get to know the Bible. Because, you know, most Christians don't know the Bible. Learn how to pray. All the above. Amen. So I sent Nengi. She's on the booth. You know, I said, Nengi, I think maybe you should start looking for a house or a, a, a place of residence. And so... Um, I sent her to my friend, and at her wages, she qualifies for possible uh, down payment assistance. But in the, in the Alameda County, she told me that it's a lottery system. So, but if she hits the lottery, you get two hundred ten thousand dollars. And so she's contending now, and if, if she gets this. She can probably get a condo, you know, and then because her sister's coming, that's why we're talking about this. Her sister's coming in the summertime, and her mom wants her, you know, rather have her owning than renting. But Nengi quietly takes care of her business, right, for the church and for whatnot. She's not really, you know, noticeable to a lot of people she just kind of quietly serves and does her thing and you know coming right out of college she's she went to well after about a year she got into kaiser amen and she's only what 23 also i think 23 24 okay 24 see okay moving on sarah's faith embraced god's miracle God's miracle power to conceive even though she was barren and was past the age of childbearing for the authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise and she tapped, she tapped into his faithfulness. So Sarah's faith is not giving up. A word is given. She's getting old. Abraham shivering too. You sure we can have a baby? So if you look at Abraham and he's like old and if Sarah looks at herself yeah I look old too and you look in and you now you're concluding based on what you see well that's not faith but this God is saying real faith is if I give you a word because God gave them a word you see they didn't give up well, at the beginning, she laughed and go, oh, maybe really, but she didn't give up, you see. So as we're reading, you can see faith is just not a, a thought, a theory, but there's action involved, right? You have to please God. What, sh what do I need to do to please God? What do I need to do? What does he want me to offer to him in terms of service, time, money, your life? What does he want? Not what I want to give to God, but what does he want? And so in order to find those things out, you have to spend time with God in prayer and reading. Amen? In fact, so many children were subsequently fathered by this aged man of faith, one who was as good as dead. He couldn't even perform. You want a baby? I'm almost dead. How can I have a baby? But faith transcend when you're dead. <laughs> that he now has offspring as numerous as the sand on the seashore and as the stars in the sky. These heroes all die clinging to their faith, not even receiving all that had been promised them. You see, faith is regardless whether these, whether a word or calling in your mind, right? Because in God's thoughts, it can mean a little bit different. Whether they materialized or not, you didn't give up. That's what it means. You didn't give up. 
even though your spouse might have betrayed you or hurt you, you didn't give up. You believe God will restore your marriage. You see, when it comes to marriage and when it comes to betrayal, from your perspective, you're like, okay, I forgive you. And why do you forgive? Because you have to. You forgive because you have to. But you got to go beyond that. You have to forgive because you have to forgive out of love. Not out of obligation because you have to so you don't end up in hell and, and you don't want to be a cursed life, right? So you say, okay, I'll forgive you because I have to. And we all start like that, which is, which is okay. But you have to come to that deeper revelation so that you can... You can receive the deeper relationship between you and your spouse, which is a reflection of your relationship with God. And you see, you may not, some of you, a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about because you haven't experienced it. But that's why faith is required, that it is possible. You see, it is possible that the, for some of you, the, the marriage that you might have dreamed of, the, the honeymoon stage never to end or even excelling, right? That your relationship can actually excel instead of just growing a butt and a belly thinking, I guess this is life. No, that's, that's the world life. That's worldly life. You can live like that if you want. You can just eat all the donuts you want. And, and, and just watch all kinds of TV and think you're secured in your relationship when, in fact, God wants to give you so much more. But you have to pursue, you see? You have to pursue. You have to try. You want the deliverance? Fine. Show God you want the deliverance. You want the health when you're sick? Show, see... Elder John has pre-diabetes and cholesterol and glucoma. I don't think he's eating donuts, but he did eat a lot of ramen, you know, processed white noodles. He could be eating donuts, who knows. If he wants the healing, he has to stop eating those things, right? If he just keeps eating it, and God heal me, heal me, I'm not so good, God heal me. That's not faith to show that he wants the healing. You have to show faith by showing God, I'm not going to eat the things that are bad for me. Then that works with him for him to come and get you. But if you're like, save me, heal me, and you don't show the action that you want to be healthy, you nullify your own faith. And if you want to go cheat when nobody's watching and you take that big old Krispy Kreme. (sighs) And then you're going to come to church and go, I don't know why God not healing me. Because you're cheating and lying, that's why. I'm not cheating and lying. You're not? (laughs) You're not skinny either. (laughs) You see? It's it's like it doesn't match. Your words and, and the appearance doesn't match. Your blood works don't match. You're just fooling yourself. You're deceiving yourself and then you want to get mad at me. Won't get mad at me because I'm helping you. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. Like, leave me alone, Pastor. You know, I'll do whatever I feel like. Leave me alone. Okay, you will get what you want if you keep at that. And I will leave you alone. And then later, when you need God's help, you know what the Bible says in Proverbs? God's like, I'm going to laugh at you. Because when I called you, I called you, I called you, you ignore me. And then when you come to me, I'm going to laugh at you. I'm not going to laugh at you, but God will. 
and you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer, and God's going to put you on your knees. You know, and, uh, and you've got to understand something, you know, God's not a teddy bear. When they come to the mountain, right, God's like, uh, with Moses, God's like, don't let them come up the mountain or they're going to die. And he's like, but still, I might break out and just kill them. He's talking about, like, I'm going to kill my people. Why? You see, why do people, like, oh, if I see God, I'm going to die, you know? Like, oh, or, or Isaiah, oh, my goodness, my woe's me. I'm a people of filth. You see, we don't see our own sin yet. If you go towards the sun, I mean, from afar, the sun feels so good. You start getting close, oh, it's getting too hot. You're going to die. You'll die if you get too close to the sun. But from a distance, it feels so good. That's how we are with God. From a distance, God, you're so good. I don't want to get too close. Then you'll reveal my sin and I'm going to collapse. So in order to get close to God, you got to get rid of your sin. The sin that you don't even see in yourself. The sin that you know is there. You see, you know it's there. We all know it's there, right? We're just in denial. The faster you, you deal with your sin, and you stop lying to yourself and lying to your pastors and lying to your spouse and your whatever, whoever, your hamster, dog, cat. I don't care. You're lying to somebody. Then maybe you'll, get, you'll start seeing yourself, right? Oh, yeah. I better go after myself. Because everybody's guilty. You can go after your whoever, you're still guilty. You see that? You are, we're all guilty. And until you come to realize you're the sinner. You're the sinner. They're the sinner. No, you're the sinner. They're the sinner, bigger sinner. Go after yourself. When you go after yourself and stop going after somebody else, then you'll get an awakening. But going after someone, I said, if you don't have the authority to go after someone, see, I can go after you because I have the authority to go after you. But if you don't have the authority, you shouldn't be going after other people. You're supposed to go after yourself first. Then you'll get some authority. Right? The Bible says, go look at your log in your eye. Should we demonstrate how big the log is? That's how big your log is in your eye that you can't see. Because if, if you were, if, if, if you didn't have a lot of sin and you could clearly see, you would be somewhere with God. You would be somewhere with God, okay? And, and you wouldn't be mad at other people, blaming them why you couldn't get there. When you blame somebody because you, can't, you could not move forward, that's deception, all right? Everybody can read the Bible, everybody can pray, everybody can go after yourself. You know, Elder Sarah went after Joe, uh, went herself. Think about this, they, uh, he, she didn't share this, I'm gonna share it with you. She asked him, why did you do that? He said, because you weren't that good looking at that time. And he said that recently. Now imagine if your spouse said that to you while you're trying to get deliverance. How are you going to handle that? Hmm? How are you going to handle that? It was her big test too. Right? It's her big test. Now she can probably blew up. You know, when you're going through deliverance, don't think my wife and I are not going through some type of deliverance to our, our tenure here. There's one time, one time I'm upstairs, 
and she's downstairs, and I hear this screeching. Bah! I already know what's going on, okay? This is a familiar frequency. Bah! I go downstairs, she's on the treadmill. Bah! Bah! On the treadmill. So I go to her and I grab her arm and I take her down and I put her on the couch and now I'm putting fire on her to deliver her. Ah! And, and, you know, and we had this discussion. She said when she was on the treadmill and she was yelling, she didn't think she was actually manifesting. She thought it was just her own frustration. Some of your wives understand this, right? <laughs> you're manifesting, okay? You got to know when you're manifesting. <laughs> Maybe you should call your husband and give you some fire, right? Get out. That's why, you know, last night with Elder Sarah was on the floor, I was like, get out. And she's like, what? It's mine. Could have been the it's my spirit, like it's my mind. Not actually the demon saying, This is my house, right? So you have to know the frequency. Okay? If especially you marry people, when you hear the frequency of your spouse, your wife or husband, yeah! okay. It's a demon. <laughs> I better go check. A lot of times when you act out, you're actually manifesting the demon. Sometimes, you know, you're mad and these words just start coming out of your mouth, right? F this! <laughs> you're not even thinking, it just comes out. That's a demon. Okay? You got demons. And you have to realize this, you know, oh, I, I, F this! Yeah. No, you should videotape yourself sometime. <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right. That, that's it. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, God. I want you to read chapter 11 and look at the, how faith correlates with a particular action or momentum. Okay? It's not just presuming with the thought I, I am, although you start there, you are, and therefore you do. You see that? You believe, therefore you do. You believe you're gonna, you're gonna go fight for your country, well then they go join the army and then they go fight. You believe you're gonna have a career and you wanna be some particular, you know, somebody, you go and start studying or moving in that direction. You see, you don't just sit there and go, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna have a business, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be somebody, I'm gonna be a millionaire. You don't understand what it takes to be a millionaire. You have to go beyond your comfort level of what you do right now. The people, successful people of the world, millionaire, billionaire, they, don't, they didn't become like that because they got lucky. They put in a lot of hours and they read a lot and, and, and they put in their time and they paid a price to get there. So you can't look and go, yeah, oh yeah, they got lucky. It doesn't work that way. Now some people do inherit, but to sustain that still requires a, a lot. And so if you want to be a child of God that lives beyond this physical realm, it's not just believing as in a thought. You have to move in that action. You have to be a people of prayer, word, fellowship, a one who examines yourself, learning God's order, authority, his system, if you will, right? Because if you don't understand the, his, his government and how God operates, you're going to break his laws. 
If you work for a company, what worked in one company where you come from doesn't work in another company. You have to listen to their policy, their rules, their procedure if you're going to succeed. You don't just say, well, I know better than you. No, you're the employee. You don't know nothing. And when you come to church too, just because you think you hear God, you think you somewhere or somebody? No. Well, where, where are you with somebody then? Most people who are like that are just homeless and uh, homeless prophet and, and broke. And their pride is like, ah, hear God. You hear your stomach. All right, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, God.